Reef quiz number two, coral tissue production. We share 20 questions and answers from our 52S2 Live. Can you beat the community and Jason? But more importantly, how much progress is the hobby leaving on the table? 52S2, quiz, hour two, coral tissue production in organics. Okay. Okay. We're not talking about light anymore. We're talking about organics. We're talking about food. You're going to hear nitrate and phosphate in here. True or false? Carbohydrates like glucose and glycerol alone can sustain a coral. I don't believe it to be true that they could sustain it alone. So false is my answer. All right. So what does the community say? And drum roll, please. We have 68%, uh, oops, 70% oh, yeah, percent that think that's up. false. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that is true. So one of the things that was like repeated in like when I was a young reaper over and over again is the corals can produce 90% of what it needs and you know you don't need to do it, worry about anything else because the coral can do 90%. And you're gonna learn that like, while that statement's true, it's really, really misleading. Because the way that it's presented is like, well, what if I gave you a 90% of a sandwich? Okay. You know, like, would you survive if without sure. the 10% of the sandwich? Sure. Yeah, I think that we all come to the conclusion that but it's not as simple as just energy production of glucose and glycerol. We're talking about amino acids, essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, some of these things that the uh, zooxanthellae and the coral cannot produce on its own, okay. right? Without those things, uh, its biology is definitely going to suffer. Okay, so uh, it would be true uh, that, oh, oh, it would be false. A true or false carbohydrates like glucose and glycerol cannot sustain a coral. The answer, I'm even kidding, cannot, it'd be true. Okay, so yeah. first one, you all and myself, we got it right. There we go. Uh, which of the following is a false statement on what a coral is composed of? So what makes up a coral, right? Like especially it's tissue. Okay, so proteins and amino acids make up approximately 50%. Lipids and fats make up approximately 35%. Sugars and minerals make up 15%, and nitrate and phosphate makes up 2%. Which one of these is a false statement? Um, which is a false statement? Protein and amino acids, I have to go with 50%. That seems like too high of a percentage. Seems like, seems like a lot. Yeah. All right. So we'll select that one for you. Uh, and we would find uh, uh, that okay. it's pretty well diverse here, man. Uh, I don't think the answer is real clear to a lot of people. Uh, but uh, the answer is actually nitrate and phosphate uh, making up 2%, which is another third of the people. Okay, so we're pretty divided between yep. the first and the last answer. Yeah, so it's true. Uh, proteins and amino acids do make up about half of the coral's tissue. Uh, sugars and minerals make up about 15%. So often, like minerals are referred to as ash, you know, but okay. like it's uh, minerals in there. Uh, lipids and fats uh, make up 35%, and nitrate and phosphate uh, do not make up 2%. Uh, we'll get into that in just a little bit. True or false? The zooxanthellae, that symbiotic algae that lives within the coral, that collects the uh, light, carbon dioxide and water, turns it into sugar. Okay, that zooxanthellae can produce glycerol, glucose, amino acids, lipids, and fats. It can produce all of those things on its own. True or false? Um, process of elimination. I think that's too many functions for it, so false. Okay, what do you think the community says? I, I think they're with me on this one. Okay, no. 36% would uh, say false. The answer is true. Uh, the okay. zooxanthellae can actually produce uh, uh, glucose, glycerol, amino acids, lipids, and, and fats. Now, it can't produce all of those variations of those things that the coral might need. We'll get to that in a second. But it can produce all of those things. And that's the heart of that symbiotic relationship where the zooxanthellae can actually produce a vast, vast majority, like 90-some okay. percent of what the coral needs and it, uh, what it needs for itself as well. Got it. True or false? Corals and zooxanthellae can produce all of the amino acids they require. All. Okay. So... I know it says all, but in the wild, they have to. Nobody's nobody's pouring gallons of amino acids into the ocean. So I'm going to stick with true. Okay. I the feel a the answer is, we're going to select true for you. 
twenty percent would have agreed with you. Nineteen, it's going down. Okay. Uh, hey, the nineteen percent of you. I see uh, what you're thinking. You would be wrong. Well, yes. wrong. But yes. We're thinking alike. Okay. Uh, so uh, the answer is a thing called essential amino acids, right? Mm. So there's all kinds of amino acids and they're all like Lincoln logs. You know, they kind of build together to build a house. In this case, you're, you know, assembling all of these little uh, 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 molecules to build a protein, you know, being, you know, your tissue, your sure. hand is an assembly of a Lincoln log of all these things. Now, there are ones that are called non-essential, meaning your body can just like create these. You can eat food or whatever, you know, it just can create it on its own. Okay. Then there are other ones called essential amino acids that you cannot create on your own unless you acquire these things from your environment or diet. Okay. Right? Okay. The coral has these two. Uh, I actually went down and like uh, uh, Dana Riddle has a great article on amino acids. And it's pretty nerdy, but you know, it'll go down like all the amino acids and it'll tell you which ones are essential. And it's not the same, you know, for each coral, each coral like can synthesize some amino acids that other ones can't, <laughs> you know, uh, like it's like, Thinking about a coral like as coral, like means the entire animal kingdom is the same, and a lion is the same sure. as a cat, as right. a frog, a, a, as a fish. Okay, like, it's just not true, right? Yeah. Okay, and we all all adapted to different environments uh, and have different biological makeup. So in this case, the answer is that they can't. In the essential essential word, they're going to get these things. Uh, do I share where we get them from? Uh, well, so they're going to get them from their environment and diet. So uh, I'll explain a little bit more as time goes on throughout this one. But like you are going to have to find those things to be able to make complete proteins or healthy ones anyway. So our, outside of carbon, oxygen and hydrogen, what makes up most of the coral's tissue? Nitrate, phosphate and sulfate or nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur? OK, I'm hoping at least a portion of the community uh, goes with me on this one. I'm honestly, I'm not 100% sure. I'm going with nitrate, phosphate, and sulfate because the sulfur and the other answers throw me off. Okay. So what do you think the community says? Uh, well, you probably think they think the All same thing. All I need thing. is 20% to agree with me. Okay. Uh, and 33% would okay. have picked what you picked. Okay. Okay. Ah, so I it sounds thought... like we might have been wrong, but. Good job, guys. Uh, I would have thought that uh, it would be the different direction, but no. So basically nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are elements that would attach themselves. They're on the periodic table. You can go find nitrogen, you can go find phosphorus, you can go find sulfur. These are elements. Uh, and they combine themselves with uh, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen to create like a new molecule or an electrical structure. Okay, nitrate, phosphate, and sulfate are just molecules that contain, nitrate contains nitrogen in the same way that ammonia contains nitrogen. Sure. You know, phosphate, you know, there's various forms of phosphate that contain phosphorus. Sulfate is a metallic substance that contains a sulfur. Okay. All right. So in that spirit, uh, I was really surprised uh, that uh, most of the team got that. Actually, me as well. Yeah. Although, I, so I will say we're doing pretty good because these are uh, like beyond expert level questions. This is we're getting really deep here. By weight. Coral proteins are how much nitrogen? 8%, 16%, 32%, or 64%? So we're talking specific about the proteins. I'm going to say 16%. Okay. Hey, let's see. What do you think? I'll be honest. Like? I got, that's, at this point, that's just a guess. Okay. And the okay. answer would be... 37%, 40% agree with you. There we go. And you'd be correct. Awesome. Bravo, okay. Guys. Okay. Yeah. We're okay. On our way to 50% or better. So 16% of coral uh, proteins are, uh, are by weight of protein is nitrogen. So by a definition, I guess you, this is probably rough math here, but if you go back to protein amino acids, make it up 15%, then 16% of that would be mm. nitrogen. So that's one of those reasons why like some people will maintain, you know, coral, uh like uh or n low nitrate through coral growth in their tank okay right? okay yeah so uh coral growth in their tank just sucking up all that nitrogen into the tissue as it grows sure because so much of the tissue actually has nitrate which is not a source of nitrogen for a coral ammonia or urea 
nitrate, carbohydrates, or amino acids. Mm, okay, so I have to think about this one because I'm thinking about the oh. nitrogen cycle, which involves ammonia and nitrate. Oh. Uh, I'm gonna go with carbohydrates. That one seems to make the most sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you think the, uh, the team thinks? I'm hoping they agreed. This one's this one seems easier. Okay, ah, 46% would we be correct. We are a little bit split though. Yeah, 46% would be correct. Bravo, bravo. Uh, Josh, by the uh, the break time, I mean at Coral uh, question 20. Uh, so that would be a little bit. Okay. Uh, all right, I just wanted to get you prepared. Uh, all right, so uh, all right, so the answer to that would be carbohydrates, and because nitrogen, nitrogen binds itself into amino acids, like it's called like an amine group, and then there's nitrogen attached in this like amine group, and some proteins will have like more amino acids will have more of these amine groups than others, but they all have nitrogen in them. Okay, and so ammonia and uh, urea, ammonia has nitrogen, urea is like the you know, P or the comes to the gills. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, nitrate obviously has nitrogen. Amino acids, it just has the amine group in it. Carbohydrates are really just hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon reassembled in, in different forms. They don't have nitrate in them. Okay. So that's an interesting point. Do particulate foods increase coral growth? Okay. So like when I add the like, uh, like powdered foods or some foods break down or you know, I'm adding like any type of organic that's a particle, right? Uh, okay. Do they increase coral growth? Nothing notable, somewhat night and day. Uh, somewhat, I gotta go somewhat. I think it does. Okay. I'm gonna say that this answer is a, a little bit wonky, but I, I'm gonna select night and day here, uh, which uh, was actually uh, about, uh, 35 percent of the total here. So you all agreed with me for the most part. Yep. Okay. So uh, night and day, we saw this, uh, uh, like the University of Hawaii did that test on particulate foods like flow and light and whatever. Mm -hmm. And not all of the particulate foods would actually go on to create massive amounts of growth. But specifically, reef chili and reef roids performed really well in their tests. And okay. they got, grew way, way better than even natural seawater, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, so uh, the reason being is those particulate foods are one of the ways that corals actually get those essential amino acids. It's hidden oh, inside okay. of proteins. It's one of the reasons why all of us eat like meat or beans and rice to like, you know, create different mm -hmm. proteins. You got to get those essential amino acids so that your body can do this. And that's one of the ways that it, uh, they're getting it from is this uh, uh, methods is okay. uh, breaking down those foods from particular foods. Okay. What is the right uh, size particle for organic particulate foods? Uh, 0.5 micron, 100 microns, 200 microns, or it depends on the coral. It must depend on the coral. If this one is at 100%, I'll be shocked because I wrote it that way. Okay. Uh, it depends on the coral and survey says. Oh, it, it is pretty varied. Uh, nope, 90% oh. uh, says 88% uh, depends on the coral. Okay. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, all the corals uh, eat different things. Like mm. think of like a, like a, a palithoa, they can actually like grab a, a mysis shrimp. You know, think of like, right. uh, you know, sometimes a SBS coral can grab it with its tentacles, but sometimes it just like absorbs it through its tissue. Mm. You know, like there are so many different ways, uh, like the mucus nets and all the like, different ways, and they catch it in totally different size particles and, and digest it. Even like something like uh, anemone, like uh, the uh, bubble tips. You know, people a lot of times will see them like eat a silver side. Yeah, it's big food. But if you go watch them eat it, you know, like late at night, they actually just spit it out because okay. they're not capable of actually digesting it and it starts to rot inside of their pretty weak digestive system and then they just have to spit it out. Interesting. Okay, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, if you feed smaller foods often. You know, so not only is it what it'll take, but what will it keep? Because it is yeah. enjoyable to feed like uh, like big euphelia and things that grab onto it. Yep. So, uh, and that's not uh, not universal. It depends on the size of the anem anemone and different things. But what is not a way that corals capture organic particulates? If you were paying attention a minute ago, you would have heard some of this stuff. Yep. Dissolved through their skin okay. is one. Mucus net, they send out a net to go catch some things. Um, creating currents around its mouth. 
and fork and knife. Ah, uh, nice. Okay. <laughs> so me and the community get a gimme. Fork and knife. Final answer. <laughs> yeah, I got to throw some gimmies in the mix. Uh, we'll pick fork and knife. Helping uh, us get to that 50%. I mean, it is uh, 89%, uh, 90%. Okay. okay. Okay, they obviously are using fork and knife yep. for this. Uh, but uh, the reason that we have all these in here is that some of these things actually do just capture it in mucus on the tissue and they'll dissolve these like probably pattern particulate foods you know, through their tissue. Like something like a uh, uh, like amino acid, it can actually, you know, electrically capture, charge and capture it and then open up a new valve in the inside essentially and let it go. But like some of it is just capturing particulates in its tissue and it kind of dissolves right there. Uh, but you've also seen the mucus nets. You know, some of the corals send out this mucus net, catch stuff and then pull it back in. Like a Burmington snail is probably like a good example, even though it's not a coral. Interesting, because right? if fork and knife wasn't there, I would have picked mucus net because I assume that the mucus net is excreting, not taking in food. No, it's sad they're catching stuff. Hmm. Okay, uh, and currents are in the mouth. So a lot of times what you'll see is uh, like uh, the food will come near its mouth and slowly it just like gravitates towards its mouth, even though it doesn't look like it's actually moving it. Like, sure. well, how is it doing that? And basically like uh, tons and tons of these little teeny microscopic hairs that are quivering in the water, creating a current around its mouth, sending the food towards its hmm. mouth. Okay. Right. And as far as I know it, no coral uses a fork and knife. Did the corals in our amino acid test improve uh, color or health? Either one of those things. Okay. Nothing notable, somewhat night and day. So I've used quite a bit of different amino acids and I've noticed night and day improvements to uh, color specifically, so night and day. Okay. So the answer here is uh, night and day and the community says, uh, 62% says okay. uh, night, 70, oh, 67%, uh, night and day. Uh, so it was, tired. it was night and day. Okay. Was, yeah, like I was surprised. Uh, amino acids were like 20 years ago when I entered the hobby were pitched as that bit of like, this is like special, you know, snake oil. Sure. It was pitched as, you know, they produce 90% of what they need, uh, like the 90% of a sandwich conversation, mm -hmm. you know, they didn't really understand what the other 10% was. Okay, and then I started to believe, but then when I met worldwide corals, and they're like, do we use Brightwell's coral amino? Mm -hmm. And it transforms corals. It takes corals that are pale and look like crap, brings them to life, it takes corals that are about to die, brings them all the way back. And now what I would know about their ability to electrically attract amino acids and pull them into their tissue and open up essentially a valve and release them. And now it doesn't have to go through the process of assembling amino acids on its own. And you're providing also some of the essential ones, of course, it right. benefit uh, the uh, tissue. And dude, in our experiment, it was dramatic. Like the tissue is way healthier. The color was so much richer, like night, night and day. Okay. Like you would not mistake this. <laughs> hey, if you, I presented you with this and like, hey, this was this way and this way. And this one used a little $10 bottle of amino acids. Uh, you'd say, holy cow. Right. right. So uh, Brightwell uh, and, you know, coming from core, uh, worldwide, people who do this for a living. Bravo. I don't know. We did it. True or false? Corals can capture amino acids from the surrounding water. I think I might have already given this away. Yep. Okay. I think we're all going to get this true. Okay. And drum okay. roll. Uh, Still please. at 100%. Still at 100%. Yes. Okay. Uh, 100% here. Okay. So uh, it is true. Uh, oh, oh, we got 3% that didn't. Okay. Uh, but it is true. Uh, so corals can capture amino acids from the surrounding water. We already discussed it. And so like one of the first epiphanies I had was like when you're dosing those amino acids, like the KZ amino acids, it's like just kind of like some drops and you're like, I don't know. And where'd it go? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then the first time you dose the amino acids and the carbohydrate mix from uh, Red Sea and the whole water like turns green. Oh yeah. You know, you know, it's there. Yeah. You, know, you can see it like touching the surface of every coral. like. Because you made it a color, I now like mentally can make the connection that yep. it's coating the surface of everything in the core or in there, right? And now when you dive into the science of it, you know, I would now know that there's a mechanism for the coral 
to actually take amino acids out of the water in the uh, ocean, which is an electrical charge, mm -hmm. which uh, attracts the amino acid, brings it into the tissue, closes it in, opens up the valve and the others, uh, and it goes into the tissue. Right. Okay. okay. I think it's called active transport is the, the method okay. that that's happening. Okay. So this is what happens like, you know, when, you know, like things are decaying on the reef, you know, like, you know, a whole tang, a bunch of tangs come swimming by, eat a bunch of algae and then poo all over the corals. Right. You know, like they're actually capturing a lot of the particulates. They're capturing the amino acids, they're capturing the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in various formats. Uh, that is what's happening in the corals. So, uh, yes. Uh, and actually in relation to that, one of the things that I found interesting is with the KZ amino acids, you'll see that they have like SPS aminos and they have LPS aminos. Sure. Okay, like when the first time I was presented, I was like, is that just because you want to sell me like more amino acids or is that because they're really different? See, and, I, I don't know. Could I I've just use them all? Okay, I, I don't know. I wasn't really sure. All I know is people use this stuff, produce great tanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, the what I do know now though, is when you go and look at Dana Riddle's thing and you look at all of the different amino acids and you look oh, okay. at the research of the corals and some of these corals can't produce some of these things and some of the corals can produce the other ones. You can see why the most intelligent approach to this would be design the amino acids to the corals that you're trying to produce based on whether or not they can produce or synthesize these things on their own. Interesting. Yeah, now it makes sense. That's like a that's a full circle moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. True or false? In the event of limited resources, corals can store amino acids for a prolonged period of time. Mm. So there's like all of a sudden, for whatever reason, man, there's an event where there's no uh, amino acids around. Can they store them for a prolonged period of time? This one's interesting. I don't I don't believe that they can store the amino acids. No, I'm going to go with false. False. OK, I'm curious what people think here. OK, in this case, we're coming up with 28, 30 percent okay. false. OK, uh, the answer is false. They cannot. OK, OK. So the coral cannot actually store amino acids. It can store carbohydrates and fats and stuff like that. And lipids cannot store amino acids for a prolonged period of time. And that's why they need to be able to capture prey and things okay. uh, periodically. Now, there is one storage battery for like a human being uh, or for a coral. Like you have stored kind of stored amino acids, which is your own tissue. So in the event that there are no amino acids available, you'll actually start to consume your own body, right? Okay. The coral will start to consume its own body, disassemble that protein back into amino acids. Mm. Right? And well, so we definitely don't want that. <laughs> don't want that, no. So that is why like people, when you feed these things, you should feed them you know, fairly consistently. It doesn't mean like by the hour, sure. you know, but like, like not for like a week and then mm. I don't know, not for three months and right. for a week and feel like there's great benefits. Right. You know, what is not an organic nutrient? Nitrate and phosphate, particulate foods, amino acids and fish waste. Hmm. Organic. Uh, it's so for me, it's between nitrate, and phosphate and amino acids. We go with amino acids is not organic. Okay, you would select amino acids and this one's the top. Uh, it would look like about 40% of people agree. No, 50% of people agree with okay. you. Okay. 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 All right. Well, uh, they would be wrong. It's nitrate and phosphate. Ah. So uh, I, this is one of those things. If you call, you hear people talk about inorganic and organic phosphate, mm -hmm. right? So organic phosphate is basically just like fish poo, uh, foods and all kinds of other things, you know, like basically the poo contains phosphate or phosphorus, sure. phosphate. Sure. Uh, the, you know, organic tissue contains that, the waste and all that kind of stuff. Nitrate and phosphate is like kind of the net end of it breaking down. It's just like, you know, almost elemental, not, not quite, but right. like inorganic. So what is not an organic nutrient? So when you're talking about organics, I'm basically talking about foods, particulates, amino acids, things that are still organic in nature that you can capture and get nutrients from. Okay. And not nutrients being nitrate and phosphate, like nutrient meaning what it needs to lift. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, again, thank you for answering with me, because even if we get it wrong, we get it wrong together. 
Oh, you so peeps. there we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. What's the biggest hurdle for a coral to acquire many organic nutrients? The boundary layer, uh, keeping the food suspended, the knowledge that it's beneficial, or all of the above? This might be one of the 20% we talked about earlier about the all of the above, but I'm gonna stick with it, all of the above. Okay, all of the above, uh, and it would look like 70% or more people agree with you and you would be correct. Okay, there we go. Yes, okay, so these are the things, the biggest hurdles. So the biggest hurdle is getting like over the like 90% sandwich conversation. Right. Right. Uh, is that there's essential uh, amino acids and other essential things we'll get to in a second uh, that the coral can't synthesize for itself and we need to provide. Uh, and then even beyond that, like if we can provide it in ways that like amino acids where it doesn't even have to assemble itself, it's just easier for it. It's mm. healthier. Okay. So uh, the next one also is keeping the food suspended. So you'll find that like flow, in almost every case will benefit almost every biological process. Sure. So if I keep all those suspended particles, you know, let not let them you know, fall out in the filter socks or, you know, into uh, the uh, behind the rocks or settling out in the sand or whatever. If I keep all that stuff suspended, obviously there's a better chance that sure. it's gonna catch it. Sure. You know? I mean, it, it's like, just do the math. If, it, if it's suspended for a minute versus 10 minutes, it's probably gonna capture 10 times as much. Right. You know, it means that scalable. Like, that's why we put more flow, more better, you know? Well, also a good reason to turn your return pump off when you do that. Okay, the boundary layer. This is one of those things that people kind of know about, but like not everybody really applies. It applies to almost everything. But basically when the flow is hitting the coral, it looks like it's hitting it, it's not. There is this tiny little like one millimeter like layer over the top of the coral that is stagnant water. Like there's friction between the water and the coral's tissue itself. Okay. And so the water is actually like kind of like going and taking a hard right and going around it. And so the particulate didn't have actually have a chance to hit it. So the boundary layer, you have to hit it at a velocity in which it's not harming the coral, but allow that particulate to make the boundary layer so thin that it can actually uh, hit the coral with the coral can get. Interesting. It. Okay. I did not know that. True or false, number 16. Lipids uh, and fats are made up of fatty acids. Mm. So lipids and fats are made up of fatty acids. True or false? All right, that's 36, rather. Yeah, I'm leaning towards true. Okay. It's a bit of a guess. 91%, uh, 85% uh, would say uh, that is true. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is true. Just like amino acids are proteins, like the the building blocks of a, like a Lincoln logs of a protein, assemble them right, you create a little house or a protein. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing with lipids and fats. So uh, a, a, the fatty acids. And now you'll also hear things like essential fatty acids, like omega-3s and stuff yep. like that. Right. These are things that your body can synthesize on its own. So you get it from like fish and stuff like that. Okay. Right. Okay. And then like a lot of people will actually take these as supplements, you know, like every doctor I've ever been to has suggested they take this thing as a supplement. Interesting. Right? Okay. Okay. It's like real, like brain matter and stuff. You hmm. know? Okay. So uh, in that case, uh, it is definitely true that uh, fatty acids are another thing. It's part of the 10% of the sandwich you're not eating. True or false? Some fatty acids, acids are also considered essential. Gave this one away. Uh, you're saying that, but I don't remember it. Um, true. It is true. Sorry. Okay. okay. Lucky. Uh, yeah, just, just like the amino acids, the omega-3s, okay. essential. Uh, right. The ones okay. that... Essential being, I can't synthesize on my own. The coral can't synthesize on its own. Need to get it from the environment or diet. Okay. Okay. Uh, but the fatty acids, again, making up that 10%. I mean, these are like, think, can you think of off the hand of like a food that, you know, all the foods are going to have some kind of fatty acids and stuff in them. But can you think of one, an additive that is super well known for supplementing fatty acids that people love? I can't. Selco. Oh, yeah. Or Selcon. Selcon, yeah, Selcon. Okay. I, I think it's Selco. I, I've always heard that Selco, or Selcon is just Selco diluted, but I don't know what to be the case. Okay. I used to use the other one. Okay. So in that case, uh, Selco, a little like, you know, it means it's clearly like fat in this bottom. Oh, yeah. Like liquid thick, fat. Yeah. Okay. So if you wanted to supplement those things, you basically just take your dry pellet food and let it soak up all of those mm. uh, fatty acids. Mm. And boom. 
And these are like great ways to add nutrition uh, and calorie to uh, a fish that like a high energy fish, like a anthea or something. You yeah. know, like how do I get that food to be even more nutritious? And there's actually uh, uh, like amino acid soaks too. So if I wanted to get more mm. protein uh, in, into the fish as well. What is not a sign you're overdosing amino acids in particular foods? Mm. So I'm dosing yeah. too much of these things now. Okay. Like I just added just like dump Selco and uh, amino acids in there, right? Okay. Aptasia explosion. Nitrate and phosphate going up. Low oxygen or a declining pod population. Okay, I think I've got this one. Aptasia is a filter feeder. Uh, I think low oxygen. Low oxygen is, is not, not a sign. sign. Okay, uh, let's see what people think here. You said low oxygen. That would be 29% uh, uh, is pretty evenly split up. And the correct answer is actually declining population. De pod population would not be a sign. Mm. So uh, when you're dosing this particulate foods and amino acids and fatty acids and stuff like the Aptasia, if you have them, like get ready, man. They're just like a coral. Right. So the reason you know you're benefiting coral is because you're also benefiting Benef this uh, little Aptasia. pest anemone. Right. Uh, and they can explode uh, when you're feeding, feeding too much of those particular. So make sure you have a, like a method of dealing with those things if you have those things. Nitrate and phosphate, obviously, if I'm feeding way too much, uh, I'm going to end up getting more decay in there. And the decay is going to end up in nitrogen and right. phosphorus in the tank. Uh, low oxygen. When you're feeding too much of this food, that's like really kind of already almost like pre-digested. Okay. You know, it's really close and like rapidly breaks down. It creates... A, a bacterial explosion. So sometimes oh. you can see like uh, like a foggy water. It's an indication that you have uh, feed, fed too much. Now, most people would say, maybe it's going to reduce the total oxygen in the water. Well, I can tell you as somebody who has a bunch of those oxygen probes on various tanks, just for like, because we have them here, it absolutely happens. You know, when you feed too much, especially these like really kind of dissolved foods, all of a sudden, like the explosion of bacteria they consume and strip out of the oxygen at all they can strip the oxygen out and it's reduced you know and it definitely has an effect on the animals that we'll get to uh, like uh, later on today that makes sense about the bacteria and the oxygen that kind of connected the dots yeah declining pod population i, I don't think that overfeeding uh, overfeeding will probably increase the pod population actually yep probably go the Good other point. direction what is the best way to know you've made a positive change to coral nutrition a nitrate test kit, an alkalinity test kit, uh, visual tissue health, or all of the above? Uh, yeah, all of the above. Okay. I think me and the community got this one right. All, right. all of the above uh, would be 30, no, nope, uh, it would be 53%. Uh, okay, so that's more split than I thought it would be. I would actually say that uh, if what what is the best way to know that you made a positive change? Visual tissue health would be pretty difficult to see in a short period of time. In short right. time, sure. Yeah, so I guess it would be true over time that you would know that if you made a, a positive coral nutrition in a month, you would see probably a pretty dramatic change. Okay. But you wouldn't see it right away. Right. Uh, nitrate test kit is a wrong answer. Uh, the alkalinity test kit, though, is the same thing. If I'm providing the same way that, remember when I talked about when I fed the coral more light energy, right? And then it consumed more al alkalinity. Mm. Yep. The same thing with many of these foods. If you're feeding the amino acids or the silico or any of these foods, you can actually see uh, the coral consume more alkalinity and calcify faster as well. So monitor that alkalinity in real time and uh, you'll probably be really, really happy with the results. Because as somebody does these things, I don't like doing things where I dose it and then like, I don't know, maybe it's doing something, maybe it's not. I'm not likely to buy it again. If I dose it and I see my alkalinity consumption go up 20%, man, I'm doing this forever. Yep. Right? I, I now know I have benefited the biology of this animal really well. Paul, how well does the hobby understand tissue production needs of our corals? The sandwich conversation. Sure. Right? Uh, denial. It's not worth learning. That's kind of where it was 20 years ago for me anyway. Uh, learning, but not really applying correctly. Uh, I think we got 80% of this down, man. Like the hobby really has got it. We're all applying it pretty consistently well and mastered. 
like basically any time I attempt to address tissue uh, with any of the corals, man, I will do this right all of the time. The sure. hobby really has nowhere to grow. Right. Okay. Where do you think it is? I think a lot of us will agree learning about applying incorrectly. Like uh, we have a good amount of knowledge around coral health and feeding, but uh, this is a step deeper. Okay, the answer would again be yeah. what you just said. Okay. Learning but applying incorrectly would be 73% uh, of the people. Uh, and I, I feel like that's probably pretty true. This is one of those areas where people don't really know all that well, but it's not like if you, if you follow just this one hour, You've captured like a large portion of what you need to know. Well, right? a lot of it's you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, if, if the people that shared this in this hour went on to go and share with other people and go on and share with other people, we would be at the 80% in no time. Next Friday, reef quiz number three, coral skeletal production. We kickoff 52 S2 coming Friday, August 18th.